I'm going to read Numbers chapter 14 on Sunday mornings. I've been dealing with the life of Moses, and I want to continue there, beginning in verse 1. I'd like to invite you, if you're able to stand, uh, to stand with me. If not, please remain seated. If it's health reasons or whatever, that'd be fine as well. And you can just follow along. Mo uh, Numbers, I was going to say the book of Moses. Numbers chapter 14 and verse 1. <clears throat> And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. Well, Moses is dealing with a bunch of criers. Second time. Verse 2, And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. The whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land? To fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? They said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. They spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land, and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. The Lord is with us, fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. The glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. The Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And How long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and will make of thee a greater nation, and mightier than they. And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, Lord art among, the people, among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. We're going to stop there. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We pray today as we open up your word that you'd help us. Lord, we need to hear from heaven today. Uh, we know you use people and preachers, but Lord, we want to hear your voice. And so I pray you'd speak to our hearts today. Please use me as an instrument for your glory. I pray a fresh filling of thy spirit. Lord, a fresh anointing from above. Give me liberty in the pulpit. Lord, give us all ears to hear today. And I pray, Lord, if there's someone here this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that this morning they come to know Christ as Savior. And for the believer, Lord, we pray that you'd give us a new and a fresh a glimpse of Calvary that might deepen our appreciation of what you've done for us. Again, I ask your blessing. Please remove any distractions from this room and from our minds. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Appreciate your standing. On Sunday mornings, I've been preaching through the life of Moses. It's been a wonderful journey if you've been here. 
at least I believe it's been. And so far, we followed Moses through much of his life. We followed him from his birth and his upbringing in Exodus chapter 2. We read of Moses being born, and he was raised in Pharaoh's household. We read also in Exodus chapter 2 of his fleeing to the wilderness. When Moses murdered an Egyptian, he fled to the wilderness and spent 40 years there. While in the wilderness, we also read of his call from God, from the burning bush. Remember the burning bush incident? It's found in Exodus chapter 3. And then Moses returned back to Egypt in Exodus chapter 4. He comes and he presents himself to the children of Israel. He stands before Pharaoh. And from Exodus chapter 5 to Exodus chapter 11, we read of the ten plagues and God's deliverance and the departure of the Israelites from Egypt. We followed him in Exodus chapter 12 with that deliverance to the parting of the Red Sea in Exodus chapter 14. What a day that was, amen? What a wonderful mountaintop experience that was, walking through the Red Sea. And of course, we followed them also as Pharaoh and his chariots were destroyed and his soldiers and so forth. And their journey to and their stay at Mount Sinai uh, for about a year from Exodus chapter 16 all the way to Numbers chapter 10. And in Numbers chapter 10, something happened. Israel is now departing from that mountain, Mount Sinai. And all the murmuring and the complaining and the rebellion that took place, uh, God led them from Mount Sinai and brought them here where they are in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. And that is to the edge of the promised land. When they come to the edge of the promised land, imagine they're about ready to go in. What a joyful time that must have been. All the difficulties and trials that they had faced and now, and the time they spent at Mount Sinai, now they're right on the edge of going where God had led them to go. We come to one of the most familiar stories in the book of Numbers, perhaps even arguably in the entire Bible, and that is the story of the spies. Children sing a song, don't they? Twelve men went to spy out Canaan. Ten were bad and two were good. What do you think they saw in Canaan? Ten were bad and two were good. I won't do the rest. I'll spare you of that. <laughs> when they arrive on the edge of the promised land, that place called Kadesh Barnea, we find that they, they send out twelve spies to go and spy out this land to see what it was like. Now may I remind us this morning that God already told them what it was like. It was the promised land, hence the name. God promised it to the children of Israel. God himself said it was a good land. He said it was a large land. He said it was a land that was flowing with milk and honey. Somewhat, if you will, if you don't mind the expression, a paradise on earth. I mean, a beautiful place. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 16, when it describes this land that God had brought them into, it describes it as, quote, the glory of all the lands. What an amazing place. This would be the place where God would use them to fulfill His will for their lives. And all they had to do was to go in and possess it by faith. But they're not going to. Because of what happened here in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. When those 12 spies return, after 40 days of spying out the land, they come back with conflicting reports. Ten of them, we know, brought back an evil report. Look at Numbers chapter 13 and verse 32. We read at the beginning, and they brought up an evil report of the land. They say that it was a land uh, that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. But there was another report given, and that was a report of Caleb and Joshua. They said something different, while the ten spies said, No, no, it's not a good land. It's a bad land. It's a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people in the land are, are like giants and were grasshoppers in their sight. Caleb and Joshua said something different. We read in verses 6 through 9 of chapter 14 what they said. Look at verse 7. The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Who would they listen to? Well, they listened to the ten. 
You know the story. This evil report of the ten spies caused the entire nation of Israel, millions of people, to refuse to go in and obey God and possess the land. When we begin in Numbers chapter 14, we find the children of Israel lifting up their voice, the Bible says. They're now crying, they're now weeping, and they're murmuring against Moses, and they're murmuring against Aaron. And in chapter 14, at least the portion that I just read and beyond, God is going to deal with this rebellious people and their actions. You know, as I read this chapter, there are many, many things, many Bible truths that could be preached about. And I'm sure you've heard this chapter preached many times. We could talk about the sin of complaining. How the people of God murmured and complained against the will of God and the way of God. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But I'm not going to preach about complaining today. Maybe I should. Because I struggle with that myself. We could preach about the character and the faithfulness of the two that said, yes, let's go in and possess the land. Joshua and Caleb, wow, what men of God they were. We could talk about sowing and reaping, a principle in God's Word. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And, and we, that's indicated in verse 2 of our text, where the people said, uh, would to God uh, that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would to God we had died in this wilderness. Then in verse 28, of which I did not read, we read, Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Be careful what you say, may I say. Be careful what you ask God for. Here they were saying something. God says, I'm going to do exactly what you said. You sowed this, I'm going to reap. You're going to reap this as well. But this morning, I, I'm going to preach on something a little different. I'd like to draw our attention to the man who is the subject of this series, and that is the man, Moses. I'd like for us to notice in this passage that I read what he did. I read the rest of the chapter, and you have as well. I know how this all ends up. But for this moment here, in these verse 20 verses, uh, first 20 verses, I want us to see something very unique about Moses. Because when I read this story, at least those verses I read this morning, do you know what I see? I see the gospel. I see the gospel. You say, what is the gospel, preacher? The gospel is divine in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that he died for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead. He was our substitute for our sins. I'm going to preach about that this morning. I see, I see the gospel of Jesus Christ and I see in Moses a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that in the word of God there are many times that the Bible uses either a person or an event or even an object to picture the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see it in the person of Joseph. Joseph was a great picture of Jesus Christ. We see it in King David. King David was a picture at times of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see it in King Solomon. All of them pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. Although, as we all understand, imperfect pictures. They all have faults. They all have men. So they do not perfectly represent the Lord Jesus Christ, but we see aspects of his work in each of their lives. We see a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in Abraham, when Abraham went to sacrifice his son. We see a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Passover lamb, the lamb that was slain for the deliverance of the people. We see it in the brazen altar, in the tabernacle, all of these things. And I believe we see it in Moses as well. We see here a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, unless you think that I am stretching this a bit, hold your hand here and quickly turn over to the book of Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Because we read in verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus who was faithful to him that appointed him, watch this, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. So there's a picture here of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 3. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, speaking of Christ, 
Inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. Look at verse 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant. Here it is. For a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Jesus Christ. He's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now go back with me, if you would, to Numbers chapter 14. Because if we were to look at all the recorded events in the life of Moses, I personally believe that it is this event in particular that best displays, more so than any other event, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. So this morning I'd like to preach on the subject the gospel in the wilderness. The gospel in the wilderness. I believe in this story we're going to see a wonderful parallel of what Jesus Christ did for me and for you. Notice, first of all, number one, the rebellion of the people. These were a rebellious people. Notice what we read in verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this, unto this land, to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? In verse 4, And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. Look down at verse 10. Speaking of Moses and Aaron. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Pretty rebellious if you ask me. You know, God had a plan for the children of Israel. They were redeemed from Egyptian bondage in order to be brought into the promised land. That was God's will for them. God commanded them to possess the promised land. It was not a suggestion. It was a command. We read in Deuteronomy 1.8, Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. God commands them to go into this land and to possess the land. And if they did that, if they obeyed God, that God would bless them. God would provide for them. God would protect them. God would give them victory over their enemies. But we find as we read our text and we read these two chapters that instead of obeying what God commanded them to do, we find them rebelling against God. You know, I see their rebellion in three ways. I see it, first of all, in their crying. You see, what are they crying about? Did they lose a loved one? Did their little puppy get hit by a car or something like that? I mean, what are they weeping about here? Notice what they're weeping about. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. They're crying about wanting to go their way instead of going God's way. They're crying because they want to choose their path of unbelief instead of trusting God and choosing His path of faith. And so their crying reveals their rebellion. We also see it in their criticism. Look what they say in verses 2 and 3. We read, And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. Notice what they're doing. They're criticizing God's leaders. They're criticizing the very men that God would use it, was using to lead them into the promised land. They even criticize God's will. Notice what they said. Would, to God, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in the wilderness? They said anything but going into this promised land. They criticize God's will. They even criticize God's way. Look at verse 4. And they said to one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into uh, Egypt. We read in verse 3, they even criticize God himself. Notice what they say. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land? God, why did you bring us into this land anyway? Did you want to kill us? Did you want our wives and our children to fall by the sword? They are critical of God himself. 
So we see their rebellion in their crying. We see their rebellion in their criticism. We also see their rebellion in their conspiracy. They have a plan. It wasn't God's plan. But it was their plan. They conspired again in verse 4. Let us make a captain and let us return in to Egypt. They, they conspired to reject God's plan. They conspired to return into Egypt. They conspired to replace one of God's chosen leaders with a leader of their own. They even wanted in verse 10 to take the very leaders of God and stone them to death. What's wrong with them? They're rebels. What an utter act of rebellion against everything that God had planned for them. You know, this story is a perfect picture of the sinful nature of man. I like to often look down my nose and I see what they did. And I say things like this, perhaps you do, I would have never done that. I would have trusted God. I would have listened to God. But then I come off my high horse and realize that's probably exactly what I would have done. Because inside you and inside me and inside them and inside every human being is a rebellious heart that rebels against God. I want you to turn back with me to Genesis chapter 1 because we see why we are this way. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, we read of the creation of man. Adam and Eve placed into the Garden of Eden. Imagine a perfect world, if you will, a world uh, where they enter in as innocent. Yes, free will, uh, free will, able to make their own choices. But God placed them in this wonderful, beautiful garden and provided for them everything that they needed. We read in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our own likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, notice what he says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the, uh, tree in the which is a fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for me and to every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for me. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. What a beautiful place. God wanted to bless them. God wanted to dwell with them. God wanted to provide for them. Uh, God wanted to, uh, to fellowship with them. But notice in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16, God places upon them a restriction. We read in verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou, thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eat thereof, eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He put a limitation. You know the story as well as I do. Adam and Eve chose uh, uh, to disobey God. Uh, they chose to rebel against God's plan. They chose to rebel against God's will. And from that moment, a sin entered into the world. Uh, and we know that that very sin nature that Adam and Eve possessed has been passed along to all of us. Every one of us has the same sin nature in us. Every one of us. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So understand something. All of us, by nature, are rebels. We are sinners through and through. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are sinners by birth, and we are sinners by choice. That's who we are. You ever notice you never have to teach a child to do wrong? You never have to tell your child, well, in case you want to know how to lie and cheat and steal and disobey and uh, clunk your brother or sister in the head, here's how you do it. No, they just naturally do that. 
I mean, it just comes out of them. What we have to teach them is to do right. We have to teach them to do what they're uh, supposed to do. But naturally, inside of them is that bent, that sin nature uh, to do wrong and rebel against God. And as we grow up, we just learn to cover it a little bit better. Because it's in us. You see, our hearts are no different than the hearts of these people, the Israelites, that we find in Numbers chapter 14. Uh, turn with me to Romans chapter 3, if you would, please. Because here's, I like to read this passage when uh, I begin to think that I'm really not so bad. I read this passage and I realize I am bad. I am a sinner. I am a rebel at heart. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. Verse 12, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, uh, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Uh, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You say, preacher, well, that's, that's not me. That is you. That is me. Now, you may not have done some of the things that some other people have done. Perhaps it's because of the restraints of society. Maybe that's kept you from doing some things. Perhaps it's because of the moral upbringing that you have. Uh, perhaps it's because you're afraid of getting caught. Perhaps you fear the consequences. But the truth of the matter in a, is that in us, in every one of us, is what Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 says. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You say, preacher, I thought I'd come to church and feel good today. Well... Not yet. Hopefully that's coming. But every one of us has rebelled against God. We've broken his commands. We've, we've disobeyed his laws. And all of us would stand guilty in a court of law before God. Oh, God help us. You know, we went out talking to people yesterday. It's a soul winning, trying to witness to folks. And I was with Brother Noel Buckley. And he got to lead, he, not lead a guy, he got to lead the discussion. And he was talking to this, uh, to this guy that uh, had a problem. His problem was he, he could not recognize that he was a sinner. He would say things like, well, I obey the Bible. I'm doing what the Bible says. And I, I, and I wanted to jump out of my skin. And I want to say, really? The Bible says, thou shalt not bear false witness. Have you ever told a lie? The Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother. Have you ever disobeyed your parents? You see, as we compare ourselves to God's law and God's righteousness, you see, the problem is our culture and our society has taken sin so lightly anymore. What once was viewed as sin and wickedness and ugly in the sight of God and even in the sight of culture, uh, today is now acceptable and practiced all over the place. Adultery and fornication, we used to call it living in sin. Uh, that's a sin against God. But today, what's the matter with that? See, that's the problem. That's the problem. You see, the Bible's very clear. Every one of us are rebels against the God of heaven. We are rebels at heart. Notice, first of all, the rebellion of the people. Secondly, I want you to notice the condemnation of the Lord. Go back to Numbers chapter 14. Notice what God decides to do. After, after Israel uh, complains, after they're crying, uh, after they want to make a new leader, all of a sudden, can you imagine, shows up the God of heaven. We read in verse 10, But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, notice, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? Notice verse 12, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. The words of God. May I say, he wasn't happy. He wasn't pleased with them. 
God saw everything that was going on. May I remind us this morning, He sees everything that goes on in our lives as well. Oh, we can come to church and we, can, we ought to come and we ought to dress like we're coming in the house of the Lord and we're glad you're here today. We ought to be here today. But the truth of the matter, God doesn't just see us today. He sees us every day. He sees us at work. He sees us on Friday night. He sees us on Saturday night. He sees what we're doing, when we're doing, how we're doing. He sees the thoughts and intents of our very own heart. He knows. And he saw what they were doing. And notice what he said he'd do. He pronounced condemnation. He was going to smite them with pestilence. He was going to disinherit them, destroy them, make a, of Moses a nation mightier than them. You may be thinking in your mind, well, that sounds like a mean God to me. Well, not at all. As a matter of fact, that sounds like a holy and just God of the Bible. You see, the Bible declares that God does love everyone. Amen? But he's also holy and just and righteous, and he loves righteousness, which means he hates sin. And because of his attribute of being just, he must, he must judge sin. And that's what he's doing here. He's judging it. You see, the wages of sin is death. God declares the penalty for your sin and my sin to be death. Death? Yeah. Death. Death. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. This is God's requirement for the punishment of sin. You say, what's that? Physical death? Yes, part of it. But also being separated from God for all eternity in the eternal torments of a place called hell. That is the just penalty for our sin. You see, when Adam and Eve uh, sinned in the Garden of Eden, you say, well, they didn't drop dead. You're right, they did not. But at that moment, they were separated from God, destined for hell for all eternity. And the physical process of death began. Their bodies started to die. We all know what that is. Because we experience that. No matter how much we exercise, no matter how good we, we eat, all of us are going to physically die. You know why? Because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Sin brings death. And if we die not knowing Christ as Savior, we'll not only die physically, but we'll die eternally and spend eternity in a place called hell. That is the judgment for sin. That's what it is. Do you know that if you're here today, you and I, uh, if you don't know Christ as Savior, for those who don't know Christ as Savior, you're condemned already. The Bible says in John 3, 17, he that believes on him is not condemned, but he that not is condemned already. You're condemned already, destined for hell. This is God's condemnation. Which leads me to the third point, and that is this. Notice the decision of Moses. So notice the picture here. We're going to see a picture of what Jesus Christ did. Here are these people that have rebelled against God. They've disobeyed His way. They've disobeyed His law. They're guilty. And they deserve the punishment of God. And God said, He proclaimed, I am going to punish them. I'm going to smite them with pestilence. I'm going to disinherit them. But Moses does something absolutely remarkable. Perhaps the most remarkable decision in his life. Think about it for a moment. God said he would destroy the children of Israel, disinherit them, and immediately take this man Moses, bring him into the promised land, and make of him a nation mightier, mightier than them. I mean, think about it. That's a pretty tempting suggestion if you ask me. I mean, Moses could have said, hmm, let's see. So you're telling me you'll destroy them? And you'll bring me in the promised land. And uh, I don't have to deal with this murmuring anymore. I don't have to deal with this complaining anymore. I don't have to deal with the chiding. And I can immediately go into this promised land. I could do that. God would have done that. But he chose something that was a very selfless decision. He forsook his well-being for the deliverance of the people. It's amazing, isn't it? 
You know, I see that, his decision, as a selfless decision. In other words, Moses wasn't the one complaining. Moses wasn't in his tent crying and murmuring. Moses wasn't the one that was lusting in the wilderness and committing idolatry. Moses wasn't the one that, uh, that uh, made the calf there in Exodus chapter 32. Moses wasn't a part of any of that. Yet he chose to forsake the promised land for them. What a selfless decision. It was also a saving decision. Why did he do it? He did it because he wanted to deliver the people from the immediate judgment of God. I know what happens later. I believe that's a 40-year chastisement. I understand that. But right here, what I'm saying is he was doing it to deliver these people that wanted to stone him from the very judgment that they deserve from God. And I also see it as a sacrificial decision, meaning that it cost him dearly. He was willing to set aside his own life. He was willing to set aside his comfort, forsake that immediate entrance into the land, all to save these people. And it was the very act of Moses. Notice how God responds in verse 20. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. It was this very act and choice of Moses that brought forth God's mercy and God's forgiveness and God's pardon. What a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a picture. Do you know that Jesus Christ did much more than this for me and you? Think about what he did. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the incarnation, the God-man, if you will, the spotless Lamb of God who never sinned, neither was guile found in his mouth. Imagine who instead of allowing the judgment of God to fall upon us, which we deserve, by the way, he willingly came to this sin-cursed earth. He left uh, his heavenly throne. He humbled himself. He became a man. He was mocked and he was scourged uh, and he was nailed uh, to an old rugged cross. And he did this not because he had to do this. He did this because he wanted to do this to save me and you from our sins. He did it for you. And he did it for me. He shed his blood on the cross of Calvary for your sins and for mine so that you and I would not experience the eternal judgment of God in hell. To give every human being, no matter how evil they are, no matter how wicked they are, the opportunity to be saved, the opportunity to repent of their sin and trust Him as their personal Savior and have all of their sins forgiven and have a guaranteed home in heaven. That, my friend, is what He did for me and for you. 2 Corinthians 5.21 puts it this way, For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, uh, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. You do not get to heaven through your good works. You do not get to heaven through your baptism, through some religious ceremony, or by coming to church, or reading your Bible, or turning over a, leaf, a new leaf, or trying to live a moral life, or even trying to uh, live by the commandments of Jesus Christ. Nobody gets to heaven by their works. It's for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I want you to imagine for a moment, if I had a gift I wanted to give somebody. And I walked over and I said, Marco, would you like the gift? It does not, he wants another one too, right? <laughs> I give back to you now, okay. Yeah. Understand, salvation's a gift. You do nothing to earn it. All you have to do is take it. If Marco never took this gift, he would never possess it. As much as I wanted to give it to him, as much as he may be thinking, about, if he never received it, it would never be his. He has to, go ahead, take it. You say, how do we receive this gift of God uh, 
through Jesus Christ is very simple. Romans 10 and chapter 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. All you have to do is admit yourself a sinner, a rebel against God, guilty before a holy God. Admit that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead. And he is the only way to heaven. And then receive him by praying and asking him to be your personal savior. And the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise of God. You don't get to heaven through Capital Baptist Church. You get to heaven through Jesus Christ. But you have to receive the gift of God by praying and asking him to be your savior. So I want to ask you this morning, the gospel in the wilderness, do you know him as your savior? Are you certain today that if you were to die that you'd go to heaven? Are you certain? Maybe today you'd like to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to be your savior. You can do that today. It's very, very simple. I'll instruct you in a few moments on how to do that. But maybe you're here today and you are saved. Can I throw this in? for you that know the Lord as Savior, thinking about what he did for us, doesn't that make you want to serve him? Shouldn't we want to give him our all? Shouldn't we want to be faithful to church and faithful to his work and do the things he wants us to do? Not in order to gain heaven, but as a way of saying, thank you, Lord, for what you did for me. That's the biblical response to salvation. But if you're here today and not saved, would you receive him today? Moses, a picture of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together.